information. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. So here we are on our journey through the life of Moshe Rabbeinu, of Moses, and on some level, we get into different things along the way because his personality was so vast and there's so much to really explore to understand him as a person and to understand what he stood for. So for example, last week we spent pretty much the entire time delving into the idea of prophecy and uh, the uniqueness of the prophecy of Moshe. This week what I'd like to do is focus on leadership. Becoming a leader. What does it mean to be a leader through the eyes of the Torah? And hopefully we'll see many examples from the life of Moshe Rabbeinu. By a show of hands, how many people in this room are leaders? Don't be humble. Jeff is a leader. Okay. Everyone calls me for all the plans. Wow, beautiful. And the truth is, the definition of leader, I think, is a lot more expansive than we assume it to be. You don't have to be the president of the United States, but much that's a good example of a leader. But <laughs> forgive me. But I'm both. Okay. I think we're all leaders here, and I'm not saying that to make you feel good. But when you understand the basic definition of leadership, it's very simple. What I do, given my relationship with you, or my association with you, by definition has an influence on you. I don't have to have a title. I'm a leader. My interaction with my family, my interaction with society, my interaction with my friends at the office, the way I act, influences others. That's what leadership is. Now, you have husband and wife. Obviously, the way I act with my spouse has a direct influence on my wife. And she has a direct influence on me. With children, it's even more profound. What side of the Ten Commandments do we have the obligation of honoring one's parents? You know, they're broken down into five and five. The first five seem to do with the issues between human beings and God, and the second five have to do with interpersonal issues. Not stealing, not committing adultery, not murdering. So where do you think you would find the obligation of honoring your parents? The first five between you and God, or the second five between you and other human beings? Oh, number five. Not only in the, in the section, but the number. Beautiful. Happens to me when people tell me, I'm not so religious, I keep the Ten Commandments. I like to respond, Do you know what number four says? Keep Shabbos. Shabbos. And so it's not so easy to keep the Ten Commandments. But number five, the doctor's right, is honor your father and mother. So why in the world is it on the side that deals with man and God? It should be on the side that deals with man and man. So one suggestion is, because the relationship created, or the, the perspective that a child has towards his or her parents, that itself creates my perspective, the child's perspective of the infinite. The way I view mommy and daddy will create my image of God. Because those are my creators. To get philosophical for a moment, you can ask the more basic question, why do we have this system? Why is there a system of men, women, come together, have a child, and they have to raise that child for 30 years until finally they can do something on their own? Why do we need that system? Let everyone kind of grow like, like plants. What's that? The Torah. Well, that's true. It does continue the Torah, that chain, you know, passing down the traditions, but why in this way? Theoretically, God could have created a world where people grow from the ground. You know, that's family planning. How many seeds should we put into the soil? 
and we could teach our children? The basic answer is, is because God needed there to be in the reality in which we live a system of creator and creation. Because by us having that relationship with our physical creators, that's a springboard in developing a relationship with the infinite creator. That's why we need creators here. So from the parent's perspective, that means I, the way I speak to you, the way I act with you, my behavior, what you hear me say, I'm painting a picture of God that will last in your mind forever. That's a pretty big responsibility. So as parents, we definitely are leaders. Oftentimes, I think, personalities are oftentimes based on their perspective of God. This person's more aggressive, this person's more passive, more kind, more gentle, more angry. That's based on what your family was like. I'm not going to get into nature versus nurture. I'm sure they're both true. But a large part of it is, what kind of family did I grow up in? Do I assume God is loving and kind? Well, it's a lot easier to believe in that if my parents were loving and kind. If my parents were constantly nitpicking and, and criticizing me, always putting me down, it's a lot more difficult to really believe in this all-embracing, loving God. So as parents, we're leaders as well. Number two here on the sheet, the difficulty of detecting leadership qualities. So we spoke about Moshe having the experience of the burning bush. And God comes to him telling him that he's the leader. He's chosen to go down to Egypt and speak to Pharaoh. But Moshe has a very difficult time recognizing that quality within himself. And he brings many excuses as to why I'm not the man for the job. My older brother, or maybe Yeshua, or anybody else. I can't speak well. Seeing leadership qualities in others is also very difficult. King David probably goes down in history as one of the greatest leaders of the Jewish people. We'll get to him in a couple weeks, God willing. The, the beginning of the story is where Samuel, Shmuel the prophet, he is led to the family of Ishai, Ishai being the father of seven young men, the youngest being David. And he has this sense, he knows that the next king of Israel comes from this family. And he's looking at all the brothers, and he's just not feeling it. He goes over to the tall one, to the strong one, the charismatic one. It's not there. So I guess I made a mistake. And then Ishai says, well, by the way, I do have one more son over there, the little runt of a boy, scrawny little guy. Shmuel goes over to little Davidal, and lo and behold, he's Melech Yisrael. He's the next king of Israel. So it's not always easy to see it within ourselves, and it's not always easy to see it within others. Detecting leadership qualities is very difficult. What is the or a couple prerequisites to become a good, effective leader? So we have here in the second section, the, the umbrella is, it's not about me. If leadership is what I could take, what I could gain from this position, and the amount of honor or prestige I'll gain, it's not going to work. It's not about me. Gaining respect is something that every human being tries to do, and we need respect. We cannot function without a feeling of people appreciating who I am. If I feel that I contribute nothing, then uh, I just wither away and die. But how do I gain respect? So the Mishnah tells us something very profound. The way to gain respect is by respecting others. Sounds good, but how does that make any sense? Why will people respect me more if I appreciate them? Get what you give. Sounds good, but, but tell me a logic. People look around the world and they interact with many people throughout their day. I want to respect you. And there's something about you that I would like to connect with. People are intrinsically good. We believe that. 
we have a lot to work on, a lot of barriers to get through. In the elevators, always a good example. You're standing there with a total stranger, and it's one of the most awkward 15 seconds of the day. So what do you do? So Baruch Hashem, nowadays we can do this. And it makes it all better. All right, I'm checking in an email, I'm returning a text, I have no need to, to say anything to you. But I dare you, here's an exercise, here's homework for the week. Next time you're in the elevator, instead of trying to hide and not make eye contact, look at the person straight in the face and say, good morning, how are you? Their reaction is always a sigh of relief. Good, thank you, how are you? It's huge because people want to connect. The barrier, though, to real connection is when I feel you don't get me, you don't respect me. If I see that you respect me, if I see that you appreciate me, then I'm able to tap into my natural yearnings of connecting and respecting and appreciating you. That's what the Mishnah means. To gain respect, you have to give respect. D of this is you cannot hide yourself. You know, oftentimes if you're in the spotlight, you can put on a show. But you could only put in a show for so long. Eventually, people get in inside and they know who you are. So if you think that you could hide yourself and only act in certain ways when people are around you, it doesn't work for that long. It might work for a year or two, but not long term. So we have here, definition of leadership is a lot more than we thought it was. Everyone is a leader in their own way. It's hard to detect the leadership qualities in ourselves or in others. The prerequisite is it's not about giving, it's not about taking rather, it's about giving, it's about showing respect and thereby gaining respect. What are the goals of leadership? So we have here number three, to uplift others. There's a great verse in Yeshaya, Isaiah the prophet, where he says, the goal is to uplift or to breathe life into those who have fallen and to breathe life into those hearts that are broken. When the great yeshiva in pre-war Europe was founded by Reb Nassim Svi Finkel, he's actually, take a look at the front cover for a second, just to picture him. He's the angelic looking personality, black and white with the long white beard, small little glasses. They all have beard and glasses, right? But that's from Nussin Svi Finkel. So he was the founder of the Slobodka Yeshiva. Before the opening day, he goes to his Rebbe, his mentor, Rebbe Yisrael Salanter, and he says, if you could give me just some advice. We're starting the new Zman, the new semester. We're very excited. What should be my main goal as the head of the yeshiva? And Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, without flinching, quoted this verse. La chayos ruach shvolim u chayos lev nidkayim. To uplift the students. It's an amazing thing to say. He didn't mention any particular methodology of Talmud study. He didn't mention any particular way of Musr learning or of anything else. The main goal of yeshiva is to uplift the students, make them understand their immense potential, help them appreciate themselves. That's the goal of the yeshiva. Now the truth is a lot of these ideas here come from this school of thought. People ask me, what kind of, of Jew are you? Are you ultra-orthodox, are you modern orthodox? That term modern orthodox really bothers me, I'll tell you why. Because if I'm not modern orthodox, and she is, that means I'm primitive orthodox. Right? I'm barbaric orthodox. So it's hard to put yourself in any category. Are you Hasidic? I'm not Hasidic. So we try to be good Jews, that's what we try to do. My own education does come from uh, one of the major yeshivas in New York, the Chafetz Chaim Yeshiva. And the founder, the creator of that yeshiva, was Rabdavid Leibowitz. Rabdavid Leibowitz was the nephew 
of the, the great Chafetz Chaim, Rabbi Yisrael Meir HaKohen. And hence, he called the yeshiva the Chafetz Chaim Yeshiva after his uncle. And to get a little bit of, a, of the chain, Rabbi David Leibowitz comes to America and he starts this small yeshiva at the time. He was very close. He was one of the main disciples of the altar of Slovakia, of this fellow over here. Now, this fellow over here is responsible for all of Judaism across America. Judaism in America did not exist in the 1800s. It was a wasteland. In the beginning of the 20th century, it was a wasteland. What changed the American scene? A handful of students that came from Europe, for some strange reason, all from that magical yeshiva called Slobodka. You have a personality of Aaron Cutler, who settles in Lakewood. The Cutler family, whew, that's Yichus. That's Yichus. And he plants himself down in Lakewood, New Jersey, and he starts the yeshiva. At the time, all there was, well, there was cows. There were, you know, nothing. Grazing land in New Jersey. Now it's the biggest yeshiva in America with 6,000 people learning full time. You have Rev Ruderman, who comes to Baltimore, and he creates Ner Yisrael. Now you have hundreds and hundreds of people learning there full time. You have a whole community that's been built around the yeshiva. You have Rabbi Yitzchak Hutner that comes in and he creates a massive yeshiva in, 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 uh, in Brooklyn. You have Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, one of the giants of the, 20, of the 20th century, who is part of the yeshiva Torah Vedas, also changes the American scene. You have Rabbi David Leibowitz who comes in and starts the yeshiva Chafetz Chaim, and that changes things as well. So you have a handful of people who are infused with the I guess the world view of the altar of Slobodka of Nosson Svifinkel, they come to America, they change history and destiny forever. Now, my particular background is with Chafetz Chaim, and that's my personal connection to Slobodka, to the pre war yeshiva. I'll share with you a couple of things that were big in Slobodka that that yeshiva spoke highly of. We have here in the list, this is part three, number two, and the idea of inspiring individuality. There's a fundamental distinction between assisting and molding. When you mold the students, or you try to mold the people around you, you're basically trying to make them into something. And that's not the goal of a leader. The goal of a leader is to assist them. I'm here to make sure that I plant the seeds, I make sure the soil's good, sunlight, enough water, but then I let the flowers grow. And this is a huge idea when it comes to parenting, when it comes to a spouse, when it comes to any relationship. I don't mold, I can't directly change you, I can give you the environment where hopefully you'll flourish. That's inspiring individuality. The Chafetz Chaim one time came to the altar of Slobodka, who is the head of the Slobodka Yeshiva, and he said, I'm very jealous of you because I create books. He wrote many books, the Chafetz Chaim, but he says, you create people. I can't do that. I'm writing books for the masses and, and they're gaining from those books, but you create people. Um, there's actually a phrase in the yeshiva that they would encourage the students to be a Talmud Bisiyata Darav, not a Talmud Brishus Darav, which means to be a student with the help of your Rebbe, with the help of your teacher, not a student who's subjugated to your teacher. A very, very fine balance. Okay. So we have now goals for leadership to uplift and to inspire individuality. Now the tools for leadership. We have here three basic tools, love, joy, and passion. The power of love is something that we're all in tune with. Probably we can't quite articulate it, 
but when you feel it, you see it breaks down walls. It could destroy any barrier between you and somebody else. I'll quote to you from Rav Kook, and Rav Kook we'll get to in a while from now, one of the great contemporary personalities. But one line I'll quote to you, he speaks about what he feels to be the main problem in his times. This is going back to the early 1900s. He writes, Hatarbus Hazmanit, the main issue we have to deal with right now, our problems are twofold. We, the Jews, are lacking belief. We don't have the proper tools to have a clarity of what our belief system is. And number two is we're lacking love. Without belief, and belief is probably not the best translation of that word. A better translation would be a solid knowledge. Without emunah, without that knowledge, and without love, you're lacking the very essence of life. How do we overcome these two hurdles? So he says, Yev Shirley is Gaber al Machla Zo, the only way to somehow break through. Kiim Lagalos as Kol Otros Hatov Hamunachim Babes Ginzehin Shalamuna Vaava. We have to do as much as we can to bring forth from the wellsprings of Amuna, of belief, of truth, and from the wellspring of love. Vazoshi Materis Gilui Sisri Hatora. And this is the goal of learning Kabbalah. He was of the opinion that there should be more focus in Kabbalistic study because he felt that through getting into Kabbalah we'd be able to pull from those wellsprings of Amuna, of belief, and from the wellspring of love. So love is a very powerful tool and I'll tell you from a personal experience you could have someone who is so adamantly against you for whatever crazy reason there is and there's no way to convince him or her to join you so what works? Just pure love. If they get it, if they see that you really like them, it wins them over. It's hard for someone to fight against the power of love. Oftentimes when I speak to, to college kids and they're getting more inspired, more into Judaism, so their parents could have one of two reactions. Sometimes they're very supportive and very helpful other times they feel defensive and rightfully so because in a sense by you becoming more religious what you're saying is that our Judaism wasn't good enough for you that could be very hurtful so when I have a, a, a kid in that situation and they'll ask me what should I tell them what should I share with them I tried telling them you know a speech that I heard last week and uh, this cool idea and it didn't go over so well the only answer is, don't share with them your Torah. Don't try to convert them. Just love them. Show them that you're warm, you're normal. I haven't changed, I'm not brainwashed. And the love is still as strong, if not stronger than ever. If you show those things, warm, normal, and love, they're going to accept you. They might not understand what you're doing. They don't have to understand what you're doing. Love is very powerful. There is a distinction between being a critical person and a critical thinker. Sometimes when you're a critical thinker, which is a good thing, very productive, you're able to analyze things carefully, able to split hairs, that kind of creeps into the realm of being a critical person. I pick up on all the little nuances, all the details, all the flaws in your personality. And therefore I can't fully embrace you because I see all these, all these negative things. So to have that, that ability to cut off that train of thought. I'm a critical thinker, I think well, and I analyze things, but I'm not a critical person. What's the test? What's the litmus test? Ask yourself a very basic question, which is actually somewhat sobering. When I speak about other people, which we do often, is the majority of what I say negative or positive? That simple. If every time we're sitting down and schmoozing over a cup of coffee, 
as we're playing cards, as we're playing golf, I'm usually making fun of other people or putting them down in some way. And that means I'm a critical person. How often, and, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, I'm not going to raise my own hand, but how often do we really speak highly of others? It's rare. Do you know why? Because whenever I speak well of somebody else, then I have to defend myself. Well, why aren't I doing that? When I speak negatively about somebody else, that's the best way of, of boosting my self-esteem. I'm not like that. I don't go around doing what she does. I have more self-control than he does. So it's easier to speak negatively than positively. But that's a litmus test. We know this is a claw goggle, something that we all have heard before. But we've seen this with the life of Moshe, which is, it's who I am, not what I say. I'm not even going to tell you the story of Bertrand Russell, because I've probably shared it with you too many times. <laughs> Bertrand Russell, my famous Bertrand Russell story. No? Yeah. Jan remembers it. Yeah. Stephen, okay. For Dr. Gonick, I'll share it. It's my favorite story of Bertrand Russell. He was a philosopher of the 20th century, and uh, he was a big proponent of, of subjectivity. There's no objective truth. It's all subjective. However, he did teach a class of philosophy, and he would always get involved with moral dilemmas. And one day he walks in, and everyone knows and made the news that he was just involved with something very immoral. So one of the girls sitting in the front row raises her hand and says, I don't get it, professor. Here you are teaching us philosophy and you know good behavior. How do you define good? How do you define beauty? And here you are doing these types of things. So his response was, if I was a geometry professor, would I have to be a triangle? Right? This is what I'm teaching you. I don't have to be what I'm teaching you. I'm not the subject of the textbook. He's the mistaken philosopher. We don't believe in that. The only way to be a leader is do it. Practice what you preach. The story, a young man goes to the Chazonish. I'm throwing in a lot of names here tonight. A lot of names. The Chazonish is also one of the great personalities of the 20th century. And he's married now, this young man, just for a couple of weeks. And he approaches the Chazonish and says, I don't think my wife really appreciates my learning. I learn at Yeshiva. I try very hard to accomplish a lot. But I get the sense that she doesn't really uh, respect that. She'll ask me to do lots of things and chores and errands, and she takes away from my learning. So the Chazidish told him, it's very simple. If you have more of a, of a devotion, more of a commitment to your learning, and she sees that, she'll have more of a respect for your learning. When she sees that you don't view it as this is what life is all about, you're not taking it seriously, then she won't take you seriously. Don't blame her. Learn better. Right. Put it into practice. When we do that as leaders in whatever capacity it may be, that has a very strong influence on people. We spoke about Yosef. Joseph, one of the, the challenges that he had was with the wife of Potiphar. She was trying to seduce him day after day. And one day we mentioned that it was a special holiday where everyone was out of the house except for the wife of Potiphar. And he goes, Lasos Malachto, to do his work. And one interpretation is he had in mind, finally I'm going to give in, I can't hold myself back anymore. What was the thing that stopped him? He had the image of his father in his head. He pictured Jacob. He saw his father's face. No, it was nothing Jacob said. It was nothing that he learned before. It was just having that image of what would my dad want me to do. It wasn't even about God. That's the influence that you have just by your character. A crucial part of leadership is understanding people. And number three here, we have the idea of know thyself. Before you could understand others, you have to understand yourself. There's the episode of the golden calf, where the entire Jewish people are standing around Mount Sinai. 
Moshe goes up, he's away for 40 days. He comes back down, on his way down, he meets up with Joshua. Joshua will be our next personality, by the way. And they hear this rumbling coming from the camp. And Joshua turns to Moses and says, I hear noises of, of war or of, of victory, I'm not sure. And Moses says, no you don't, you're mistaken. Those are noises of rebellion. Rebellion against Hashem. Now when he told that to Joshua, he was actually criticizing him. He was telling him, if you want to be a leader of the Jewish people, you have to know what noises are. You have to be able to hear the crowd and know immediately what that means. They're not fighting down there. They're rebelling against God. Now how is Joshua supposed to know that? When did he take the course on you know, analyzing human noises? His whole life it was spent, he was a very spiritual, devoted person. But Moses says that's not enough. If you want to be a leader, you have to get it. You have to know people. Okay. One component here is a thirst for knowledge. Hopefully we'll try to finish this up and put everything together. Thirst for knowledge is something that you can never feel that I've had enough. And when you're in that position of leadership, especially when you're teaching others, so then you can start feeling complacent. Okay, I know more than they do, so I'm good. As long as I can keep ahead of them, I'll be okay. The Vilna Gaon says, the goal of any form of leadership is to be able to give of what you have without taking away that which you have. So he gives the example, how can I fill your cup from mine without losing my own wine? If I pour from my goblet into yours, I'm losing. So the only way that it works is the Vilna Gaon is if my wine is overflowing. <clears throat> Meaning to say, if there's a constant focus on my own growth, where I don't lose myself and just focus on my position, but I'm feeding my own spiritual needs as well, so then you're gaining from me in a way where I'm overflowing onto you. And therefore I can keep on growing. The famous quote from Einstein, I have no special talents, I'm only passionately curious. Similar thing. We have to be passionate about learning. We have to have the thirst. We have to keep on growing ourselves. People would ask me in yeshiva when I was there for a lot of years already, how many more years do you have left of learning? You've been there for how many years already? It's been 10 years? 15 years? So I said, well, right now I'm, whatever I was, 25, 30, hopefully another 70. Right? The years learning are not limited to your years in yeshiva. God willing, we should be learning our whole lives. Number five is a hard one. This is something we like to talk about, but rarely do. Being able to take a stand. Being able to stand up for principles. A quote from Thomas Jefferson. He wrote, in matters of style, swim with the current. In matters of principle, stand like a rock. And that's a very true Jewish idea. Being able to go against the tide is okay. Somebody asked Yaakov Kamenetsky, another name. We must have 40 names tonight we've mentioned. I don't want to overwhelm you with all these different people. We'll get to each one individually. Yaakov Kamenetsky, one of the great personalities of the 20th century, he was having a discussion and uh, he was giving advice to someone who was the head of a a big institution and the person said to him but if I do that it's not really going to be in line with what most people are doing it's going to be viewed as somewhat different so if Yaakov said sometimes you have to learn to fife on the world fife is Yiddish for say it's all right it's okay everyone else is doing that but it's all right I'm just fine Being able to take a stand, never being afraid to fail. Oftentimes we don't want to take a stand, we don't want to go against the current because we're afraid we won't be successful. So number six of being a leader is don't be afraid to fail. Very interesting Gemara that says there were four people who never committed a sin in their entire lives. They died flawless. Who are those four people? 
Can you name one of them? Moses' father. Moses' father? Very good. Amram. Anyone else? Ishai. Ishai was the father of David. Four is a more well-known name. Binyamin. Benjamin. And the fourth, if you get this, I'll give you $50,000. <laughs> Quickly, Google it. <laughs> the fourth is Chilav. Who was Chilav? One of the sons of King David. Okay, great. These four people never sinned. They died without any mistakes. How do we know they never sinned? So the Gemara quotes this. It has a tradition. We know these four people never made a mistake. Okay. Ask me a question. Name off the top of your head four of the biggest names in Jewish history. Anybody? Moshe. Abraham. Abraham. Isaac. Isaac, Sarah, Rebecca, Jacob, Yeshua. There are a lot of big names we know all throughout Tanakh. None of those are mentioned as the four people never to commit a sin. And the only four people that are mentioned, we have no idea who they are. We have nothing on them. You could look through many different sources into the life of Ishai, the father of David, and you'll find a couple paragraphs here and there. We have no idea who he was. So the idea is as follows. Just because you never make a mistake doesn't mean you're the greatest person. The greatest people made mistakes. Abraham made mistakes. He's not on that list. Moshe makes mistakes. He's not allowed to enter into the land of Israel. His dream, his one desire to finally enter with the nation into the promised land, you can't go in, Moses. You disobeyed me. You lacked faith in me, but you're still Moses. So what's the connection between the greatest of all people throughout history are not on that list? Because they took risks. To say that I never made a mistake means by definition, okay, that's good, you're a great guy, but you weren't engaged as much. If, if your name is Moses, your name is King David, you made mistakes, but you're still King David. So that's the idea, being able to take a stand, and the only way to take a stand is by being able to fail and not to be afraid of failing. King Solomon writes in Proverbs, he says the, that a righteous man will fall seven times and get back up. Meaning to say that he'll fail. He'll make mistakes seven times, but the eighth time he'll get back up. Now, you might not be a baseball fan, but if you strike out seven times and you only get a base hit on the eighth time, are you a superstar? No. So why are you considered righteous when you fail seven times, but you get back up the eighth time? Because you got back up. <laughs> because you got back up. <laughs> exactly. The definition of, of, of a tzaddik, of a righteous person, is not about the fact that I don't have any flaws. I never made a mistake. We make mistakes. We have ways of rectifying mistakes. That's all part of a system. I've fallen on my face many times, but I keep on getting back up. That defines the righteous man. Um, let's finish off over here. Number seven is taking responsibility. And this is something we've seen in Moshe from his early years on. Even when he shied away from taking on the mission to go down to Egypt, it wasn't because he didn't want that responsibility. It was because he felt he wasn't worthy. I'm not the man for the job. Once God convinces him, you are the man for the job, then, okay, I'm not going to shy away from it. Having that feeling of, well, if I don't do it, somebody else will, you don't accomplish much. You have to have the mindset, if I don't do it, it won't get done. That's a leader. Part of that is that you feel you're totally responsible for the choices you make. And that's one thing in, in today's society which is uh, really lacking. You can have people who go ahead and 
And somebody else, my parents were very abusive when I was a child. And that's why I had to kill 15 people, right? because they made fun of me. I was bullied when I was four years old. And that's why, and that's why I had to do this, this evil thing. You can't blame me. It's my father's fault. Now, is there truth to that? There is. We, we, we do believe that, that how we're treated as children does greatly affect us when we become older. Like we mentioned earlier, honor your father and mother is in the set of the five commandments that deal with man and God because the way I treat you as a child, I'm instilling in you a picture of God. So there's a lot of impact that you'll have from the way I treat you. But it's not an excuse. To be a leader means I have to take full responsibility. I don't shy away from that responsibility. And I'm willing to take the blame. I'm willing to say, you know what, I made a mistake. Judah, one of the 12 brothers, he did that. There's a story in the Torah which we did not mention, but I'll share with you briefly. We're not going to have time to elaborate on the story. It's a very confusing one. Judah has a relationship with a young lady, and he does not assume that's his daughter-in-law. He thinks it's somebody else. And he finds out later his daughter-in-law is pregnant. Hey, how did that happen? It must be she committed adultery. Until she says, whoever staff this belongs to, he was the one who got me pregnant. At that point, he realizes, oy vey, that was me. So what does he say? He right. Publicly embarrasses himself, that was me. I take full blame for that. We'll see the same thing when it comes to King David. When he makes a mistake with uh, one of his soldiers and, and marrying Bathsheba, which we'll elaborate on, the prophet comes to him and explains what you did was wrong. David's response is, you're right. Being able to say, I made a mistake, means I'm taking responsibility and I'm fully, fully there. It's me. I'm not going to push off that blame on anyone else. Number eight is greatness is in the details. Oftentimes with the, the movies and the media, we think of great people doing heroic things. But in, in Torah thought, it's not about the once in a while, you know, he jumped into the pool and saved the person's life. It's the little things day after day. It's the consistency of trying to do the right thing, where there's no spotlight, there's no glitz and glamour. I'm not on the stage, but it's day after day, the little things, and that's where greatness develops. Um, number 10, we'll end with this, don't underestimate yourself. One of the things, probably one of the greatest things that holds us back from real leadership, from really influencing others in a positive direction, is we feel that I can't do it. I can't do it. Who am I to, to influence these people? You can never underestimate yourself. That was the flaw of King Saul. King Saul, he loses the kingship, and Samuel comes to him and says, Do you think you're small in your eyes? You're the king of all of Israel. You've got to stand up and do something. His fatal mistake was assuming that he couldn't do anything. So here are a couple ideas. We have the basic uh, goal of leadership, which is influencing others in whatever capacity it is. It's difficult to see those qualities within ourselves or within others. We have to look carefully. The prerequisite is try as much as possible. It's not about me. It's not about my honor or what I'm gaining from it, but it's an opportunity to give. The goals of leadership we specified were two, to uplift others more than anything else, to make people feel good about themselves, and to inspire individuality. Now, individuality is something that you have to inspire without allowing them to go off in their own direction and kind of leave tradition behind. It's the balance of being able to pass on the tradition in its pristine form without making people feel I'm just stuck to this mold. That's inspiring individuality. Tools of leadership, we spoke about love, joy, and passion. It's the power of love, the power of joy when they see you doing something, that itself will change them. Understanding ourselves, understanding other people, having a constant thirst for knowledge, not feeling complacent, 
and therefore we're not losing when we give but rather our cup is overflowing to be able to take a stand not to always have to swim with the current maybe in areas of fashion we saw but besides fashion you have to stand like a rock or in the words of Yaakov Kamenetsky you have to learn to fife on the world it doesn't matter what they're doing this is the right thing, this is what I'm doing not to be afraid to fail that's the definition of the righteous man you fail many times but you get back up taking responsibility and not blaming others greatness is in the details and most importantly never underestimate ourselves any questions? sounds like our present leader <laughs> you're referring to the president? yeah oh. I hear, I hear the goal is though next week I want to finish off the life of Moshe and I want to start the life of Joshua, of Yeshua and that will take us into a whole different period of Jewish history we'll continue next time okay